Ladies and gentlemen, time to make the last video. No more stalling. <laughs> nice. Okay. Uh, this is going to be about Stalin and totalitarianism of the left. Reminder, uh, left side totalitarianism means a socialist bend. It means that you're going to seize the resources of, resources of the society in order to assure that all of those resources go to the good of the people. You're not going to allow individual private property. And that's something that we're going to see the socialists do for sure under Stalin's reign. We're starting about midway through the sixth page. The only question we have on this page before we flip to our chart is the question about the difference between Stalin and Trotsky. When Lenin dies in 1924, he does so without a chosen successor. He wanted to assure that there wasn't any sort of an idea of a monarchy or a hierarchy uh, set down when he died. He wanted to make sure that the people of the, the Politburo or the Central Committee of the Soviet Union got to choose who was next. Now, he does say that he's frightened of Stalin. Stalin seems a ruthless man. Intellectually speaking, the choice probably should have been Leon Trotsky. Trotsky had been in charge of the Red Army during the Civil War. He had a much greater pedigree within the party uh, than Stalin did. Stalin was known more as Comrade Card Index. He was the man who had appointed most of the leaders of the Bolshevik party to their party positions within the hierarchy. And when it comes down to really leading the party, that's what Stalin's going to rely on for his popularity. Most people owe him their job, and he, he kind of knows their background. And that's where he's going to get all of the votes from. The big difference intellectually is that Trotsky believes that the Soviet Union needs to export the revolution as quickly as possible. In true Marxist format, we need to get as many workers on board as possible uh, as quickly as we can. Stalin, on the other hand, believes that it's time to perfect the revolution. That instead of risking the loss of the revolution in the Soviet Union by perhaps moving it too fast, and too far, we need to make sure that it's stable in one place. And so Stalin believes in what we might call socialism in one country. Let's get the Soviet Union absolutely perfect. Let's make it kind of the host country for what then becomes the expansion of Soviet ideas throughout the world, especially through Europe. But uh, the disagreement between the two men finally leads to Stalin's leadership of the USSR. Flipping to the back of the study guide. Okay. The creation of a one-party system and elimination of political opponents. Well, uh, Stalin already had the Bolsheviks as the only party in the Soviet Union, so that part is taken care of. Stalin's elimination of political opponents really is not other parties. It's within his own party. The Bolsheviks are going to make attempts to assure that uh, we are going to get rid of everyone within the party who might have an old sense of what the party was. Stalin kills off a group called the Old Bolsheviks. Anyone who was around when Lenin was in charge, people who realized that there was kind of life before Stalin. Remember I showed you those Photoshop pictures where Stalin had either put himself into important Bolshevik moments or he had erased Trotsky from others? That's Stalin's way of assuring that you don't have any institutional memory beyond him. So in the 1930s, Stalin had these show trials or purges of old Bolsheviks to get rid of opponents of the regime. Another group that he really wanted to uh, get rid of were the Kulaks. For this, I'm going to skip down to the third row here when we talk about the control of the economy. And this is the central point for the Bolsheviks, so ears up. Stalin wants to assure that the Soviet Union becomes an economic powerhouse. It's not good enough anymore for the Soviet Union or for Russia, whichever we want to call it, to be an agricultural powerhouse. That can't be the way we win wars. We're huge, we have a lot of men, and the winter is really harsh. That can't do it. We have to become industrially strong. So Stalin is going to force the industrialization of the Soviet Union through five-year plans. The five-year plans are intended to build up heavy industry, steel, coal, heavy metals, uh, build up the defense system, build railroads, build factories, in order to assure that the society becomes more industrialized. Now, we're not going to focus on consumer items. And even when the second five-year plan is supposed to focus on consumer items, it really doesn't end up doing that. So Stalin's five-year plans are a quick buildup. Let's do what Britain, France, the United States, Germany did in 150 years, but let's do it in five. Now, doing that means you're going to kill some people. Stalin has a really kind of blasé idea when it comes to killing people, that it might just be okay, right? One person's death is a murder. A uh, hundred people uh, being dead, that's a tragedy. But Stalin said that a million dead, well, that's just a statistic, that people kind of lose sense of the tragedy once the numbers get big. 
how do we assure that the workers in these new factories eat? Right? The Russian problem has always been we don't have enough food for all of our people. Stalin's particularly brilliant solution to that problem, we don't feed all of our people. Well played. Okay? So what Stalin's going to do is not feed the people who are farming the food. Take the area of Russia that's the most agriculturally productive, the western area, most of it the Ukraine, and we're going to work those people to death and take their food and use it to feed the factory workers. So we have the forced starvation of somewhere on the order of about 12 million Ukrainians in the early 1930s, people that Stalin would tell you died for the betterment of the regime. The collectivization, that's the key phrase here, collectivization of the farms under uh, the Soviet regime ends any private ownership. Those individuals who had gotten wealthy, the kulaks, who benefited from Lenin's new economic policy, we're going to specifically target them in our violence section. So more on them here in a moment. But Stalin uses the collectivization of agriculture to produce enough food to assure that the new, uh, not new, sorry, the five-year plans are working in the cities, and by doing so, he hyper-industrializes the Soviet Union so that when they go off to war in 1941, when they're invaded by Germany, this is not the Germany-Russia uh, clash we had last time in 1914, where it was a vastly superior German army against the Russians down here. This is a Soviet bear that's got some serious teeth from an industrial standpoint. Okay? Bouncing back up to the use of force against the common enemy. Uh, enemy enemies we've already talked about, right? The old Bolsheviks, we're going to target them. The Kulaks, individuals who are considered to be uh, wealthy peasants, we're going to get rid of them. Anyone who stands in Stalin's way goes down. The use of the Gulags, G-U-L-A-G-S, the Gulags, labor camps in Siberia, where Stalin's going to work and starve people to death who are opponents of the regime. The man is just brutal. You could go on for days with stories about Stalin and his paranoia and his use of violence. But seriously, anyone who gets in the way of the regime is taken out. Emphasizing the role of women in the family, just like the other uh, two totalitarians we talked about, the goal here is to make sure that women uh, make babies and that the family is kind of a mini-collective. It works like the rest of society. Uh, let's have a look here at the bottom of the study guide and talk for a moment through the end of page 6 and page 7. You guys are fine. Um, the limited growth of democracy and liberalism in Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe turns out to be a horrible place for democracy. The governments that are implanted there by the Treaty of Versailles tended to be governments that did not catch on. They're not really democratic uh, traditions in those countries. And those democratic governments are so ineffective at solving the problems of the Depression that the people in those countries begin to look at Germany and Italy and say, maybe what we need is totalitarian leadership, not democratic leadership. What does each side stand for in the Spanish Civil War? The Spanish Civil War pits the fascists against the socialists. So this is kind of World War II prequel. You've got Francisco Franco on the fascist side with the support of Hitler and Mussolini and the Popular Front or Socialist Government in Spain, which is the elected government uh, that has the support of the Socialists. And in the 1930s, the Fascists and the Socialists go toe-to-toe -to -toe for control of Spain. The Fascists are going to win largely due to the help that they got from Hitler and Mussolini. Flipping the page. Views of women and sexuality. Well, the women are going to get quite scandalous. Going to be showing off ankles and knees and all of that, and maybe a neckline. Whoo! Okay, which uh, creates a different view of what we think women should be. Uh, perhaps it's the experience of World War I. Perhaps it's the liberating experience of getting the vote. Perhaps it's the fact that women decided, let's get out and have some fun. But we're going to see styles of dress change, and we're also going to see the morals of the society changing as women kind of update where they are in the society. Culturally speaking, I want to spend a few minutes here with the culture. This is a society that is very disillusioned. World War I proves to be a kind of confirmation for the artist perspective that we are not headed in the right direction. So the artist movements and the writing movements that we see after World War I continue the trend that we had beforehand. We're going to doubt the logical, rational, reasonable approach. We're going to cast a lot of suspicion on the idea that we're headed in a perfect direction, right? Human society, we wanted to believe until about the 19th century, was headed in this nice upward trajectory, that all things were for the better. That may not necessarily be true. And the artists of society are saying, 
What did World War I really prove? What does fascism and the Depression really prove? Except that we're really good at killing people. Okay? Lost generation. A generation of artists who really feel that disillusionment keenly. Uh, the person who coins that t term, Gertrude Stein, becomes kind of the mama bear organizer, if you will, of a lot of Americans and English and French artists who end up together in Paris. Uh, Hemingway is there. T.S. Eliot is there. Uh, a lot of other artists who felt akin to that movement. Dadaism. Dada is useless. That's kind of the, the idea of the movement. Everything in life has no order to it. It's useless. We looked at Dada art. It's kind of completely silly. Dada poetry would be a mix of uh, just words all over the place. What are we trying to prove? Stop looking for order. Stop looking for logic and reason and rationality in everything we do because it's not there. We're human beings and nothing's going to make sense in that way. We carry that over to, through to the movement of surrealism, uh, which says that we should be using the unconscious to or, in order to understand our art. Uh, that when you look at a painting and I look at a painting, the painting is whatever we see it to be. Stop trying to be logical about it, right? Stop trying to be like, why the suck on that horse's hooves are backwards? That elephant has really long legs. That's not what you should be looking for. You should be really using the unconscious to sort of unlock what that painting or that work of art brings out for you. Uh, leading proponent here is Salvador Dali. Dali's going to do some fabulous work that's it's, it's odd, uh, but don't look for the logical meaning. And then we have the Bauhaus movement of Germany, which kind of is an odd uh, attachment here. But Bauhaus is an architectural movement which shuns all of the ornament and the fancy, fancy style of the past. Don't give me columns with spinny things on them and spiral staircases and all sorts of ornaments. Give me a building that's functional. Give me that Bauhaus workshop in Dessau, Germany, uh, designed by Walter Gropius. Okay, give me that kind of a setup where I can see all of the things that are needed in a building. Don't build me Versailles. Don't build me something that has extra in it. I don't need it. Last thing, stream of consciousness. I talked in class about James Joyce's Ulysses, which is kind of the stream of consciousness work. Uh, it's an inner idea of what the artist or the character in the book uh, is talking about. You hear all of the thoughts. They're not organized in a rational, reasonable lineup. So if you see something and it runs through your brain, if you're telling the story to someone else, your, your brain might be like, don't say what's going on over here. Just focus on this story right here. Stream of consciousness says, that's part of your brain. Talk about it. Be like, I'll tell you about this, and then I'll tell you about this, and then I'll tell you about this. So hopefully that makes sense. It is a little batty. That's the end of Unit 7, ladies and gentlemen. One more unit to go. Good work. Work hard. Enjoy the Casey.